Sorry? Oh, good. Good. Good morning, everyone. It was right on time. I uh, thought we could get started. Uh, this morning, I'm happy to introduce uh, Professor David Brook from Tony Brook. Uh, glad to have him. He's done a lot of uh, work, pioneering work, and studying complex shapes using conformal mappings and other things. So, he's going to talk about how to me. Uh, thank you. Uh, okay. uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, so today I prepared three topics. Um, so I believe all of them are related to uh, um, to shape analysis um, and the shape distance. Okay, the first one is Rizzi flow um, using Kahoot map to study shapes. Uh, the second one using foliation to compare <coughs> shapes, and the the, the the third one using a geometric view to uh, optimal mass transport theory and uh, the, the understanding for deep learning, so which is also related. Okay, um, so this works actually uh, uh, collaborated with a lot of collaborators, uh, Professor Yao, uh, Feng Luo, uh, a lot of mathematicians, uh, computer scientists, and medical doctors. Okay. Okay, uh, the first one, uh, let me introduce the concept for Kampong Math. So we have learned uh, this from complex analysis. Okay. So here we see, um, so this is my office. <coughs> then uh, uh, I put a frame uh, on the table. Okay. Then uh, I take a photo and shrink the whole photo to fit into the frame. Then uh, uh, the inside is a, is a virtual world, the outside is real world. Okay, the inside this frame there's a second level frame. So inside a second level frame there is a third level frame. Basically there there is a recursive structure, and uh, infinite many frames. Okay, that the center is a is a fixed point. Okay, then uh, by remove this fixed point, then we can define um, a transformation <coughs> for scaling you know, from outside to the inside. So all such kind of scaling form a form a group. Then uh, the whole plane always one puncture quotient this group. They okay, become a torus. Then uh, we, we, we map the whole thing using an analytic function or biholomorphic function to the right hand side. Then we see that uh, here we have a closed curve, the frame here, but here we come to uh, to an infinite spiral. So therefore you see the topology has been changed. Okay? But if we pay attention uh, to see the local shapes, so like, like this uh, this picture, okay. Um, then we see that, okay, that the shape locally is well preserved. Then if we see this uh, uh, pink bunny, okay, map here is still bunny. So therefore, this gives us a, a feeling for something called a home map or angle preserving map. Basically, uh, we can change the global structure drastically, but locally it's just a scaling, the shape preserving. Then we generalize this one uh, to surfaces, okay? So here we see. So we get a Michael Kilo's King David head. Okay, we digitize this sculpture, get this 2D surface. Okay, in R3, and using Kampong map, we can flatten the whole surface uh, to the 2D plane. So here we see that um, the curvature has been changed. So here the, the curve, the, the surface is curved, but here the surface is totally flat. <coughs> but if we pay attention to see the, the local features, uh, we see that the ear is mapped to, 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 to the shape, same shape. Okay, uh, the local shape for eyes doesn't change, okay? Then the, 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 the higher pattern doesn't change. So this gives you the, okay, another example for remapping from 3D curved surface to a 2D flattened planar domain. Then this mapping uh, preserves local shapes, okay? So this is called a conformal map. Okay, then uh, um, mathematically, um, so here we give a, a different geometric definition Suppose we have a two surface with a remaining metric. We have a uh, deep morphism okay, between them. Then, uh, uh, so if, if the pullback metric induced by the mapping and, and the, the original metric, they differ by the scalar function, then they say this mapping is conformal or angle preserving. Intuitively, uh, if we draw two uh, intersecting curves okay, on the surface, so the mapping map is full curve to the plane, Okay, then the, the intersecting angle doesn't change. So you can draw those curves arbitrarily anywhere, <coughs> but the intersecting angle never change. 
So this kind of mapping is very special. It's called a conformal map. By using conformal map, basically we can convert a 3D problem to 2D problems. So therefore, uh, it's much easier to precise, okay, or compare or re register 2D shapes than 3D shapes. U so, over here is the conformal factor. Sorry? U is the conformal factor. Uh, yes, yes, U is the conformal factor, uh, representing the area distortion locally. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, then there is a very, uh, so here we can see um, the property for conformal map. So uh, we're using Riemann mapping, uh, map the human facial surface to the 2D plane. Okay, then here if we put a checkerboard on a 2D plane, when we pull back to the surface, we see that uh, all the right angles are well preserved. Okay, so this, this means that the mapping is angle preserving. Uh, then if we put a circle packing, okay, on a 2D texture, when we pull back, we see uh, the planet circles are mapped to, to uh, small circles on the surface, geodesic circles. So therefore, uh, one property for conform map is they map infinitesimal circles to infinitesimal circles. Okay. Then uh, uh, for comparison, so here we compare conform map uh, with a general diffeomorphism. Okay. Then we see that for general diffeomorphism, if we put uh, small circles here, when they pull back, they become two ellipses. Okay. So they map infinitesimal ellipse to infinitesimal circles. But here, if we put a small circles here, when we put them back, they map to circles. So this gives you um, the major characteristic for a conformal map. Okay. Then uh, uh, in theory, okay, um, the conformal map from this surface to this surface is infinite. But then they form a three-dimensional group. So so the group is uh, uh, the dimension for the group is finite. Okay. So here, the mapping diffeomorphism from here to here is infinite. The dimension is also infinite. So therefore, a uh, conform map is really rare. So it's very easy to determine. So you can you can have fully control to control this type of mapping. So this mapping is too general, okay? But in practice, uh, if we know how to compute this mapping, we can compute this kind, kind of mapping as well. So later I will, okay, uh, introduce that. So then one, one of the most fundamental theorem in different geometry uh, is called the uniformization. So basically this means that uh, given an arbitrary surface with a remaining metric, then uh, using conform mapping, we can conformally map to three, one of three canonical shapes, okay? For genus zero, they can map to the sphere, unisphere conformally. Uh, for genus one, they can map to Euclidean plane, okay? Then for high genus surface, they can map to a hyperbolic space, okay? Uh, so here we can see some um, <clears throat> some demo. Okay. So here we see uh, this is a genus zero closed surface. Okay, with a complicated geometric features. Okay, then by theory they can map to uh, to the unisphere conformally. So I preserve the uh, preserve the okay the normal to this sphere, so therefore you can see the features, okay, the shadings, this showing the correspondence, okay. Uh, for genus one, uh, <clears throat> so this is genus one. The manifold cannot have boundaries, right? Uh, I, let me explain here. So this is a genus one surface. Uh, then uh, we can we can we can find a conformal Riemann metric, okay, to make it to be flat. Then we can map the uh, we can map the shape periodically to the plane. So here we show three by three periods, okay. Okay. So this is a Euclidean plane. Mm. So the mapping preserve local shapes. Okay. Mm. Then uh, for hygiene surface, it's a bit of, a little bit more complicated. So here we see a genus two surface. Then uh, <clears throat> we can find a hyperbolic metric and embed okay the shape periodically to the plane uh, to the to the hyperbolic disk. So here uh, each color representing one fundamental domain. Okay, then uh, each fundamental domain cover the whole surface. Okay, so th this is one one period, another one, different one. You can repeat this uh, this pattern to cover the whole uh, whole H two okay? hyperbolic plane. Okay. <clears throat> so therefore, um, 
This theorem actually unify all the shapes, okay, to three canonical geometries. Uh, for surface, um, <coughs> okay. Okay, sorry. For surface, with boundary, same thing. Uh, so here we have genius zero surface, and then they can map to a, uh, to a circle domain on the sphere, such that okay, each boundary become to a to a circular hole. Or you can map it to the Euclidean plane, such that each circle becomes a Euclidean circle. So this is a genus one surface with a three boundaries. Then the, uh, the uniformization theorem claims that it can be mapped to the Euclidean plane periodically. So here we, we show one theory. Then the three boundaries become, become to three Euclidean holes here. Uh, so here is high genus surface with a with boundary. Then the, each boundary becomes to hyperbolic circles. So therefore, uh, this six image. So these three with boundaries and these three without boundaries, they unify all possible shapes uh, in the world. Okay? So therefore, given an arbitrary shape uh, using this procedure, we can, we can flatten it to canonical space. Then we can perform okay, uh, different geometric tasks on the 2D plane. So that's the basic uh, philosophy. Okay, so this was proven in the uh, uh, 20th century, okay, 1930s. Then how can we compute it? The computation is a highly non-trivial. So therefore, uh, we use some method called Ricci flow to compute it. Okay. So here we show some examples for, for genius zero surface with single boundary. By Riemann mapping, they can map to planet disk. The mapping is not unique. They differ by Mobius transformation. Okay. So then uh, if we fix several points, then we can map this one to a 2D uh, rectangle. So that the shape of a rectangle determined by the geometry also, the choices for those four points. Okay. Uh, so here we show, okay, um, <coughs> surface <coughs> boundaries. So then they can they can map to uh, uh, annulus, okay, or multi-hole annulus. Okay. <coughs> okay. <coughs> okay. Then uh, uh, how can we compute it? So basically, using conventional finite element, we cannot solve it. Uh, so we try minimize it. Then uh, the most most general one, most effective one, is the surface Ricci flow. Okay. Uh, so Ricci flow is the method used to prove Poincaré conjecture. Um, so basically, so on the surface we can choose special local coordinates, which is called isothermal coordinates, such that okay the remaining metric can be read on using using conform factor, and multiply Euclidean metric here. Then under this special um, coordinates, the Gaussian curvature can be calculated using very simple form. Okay. Then suppose we conformally deform the remaining metric. Basically we multiply a positive function okay, to the metric tensor. So the Gaussian curvature will change okay, according to this equation. Okay. So basically Z bar is a new remaining metric, okay, conformal to the original one. So they differ by okay by scalar function. Then the uh, uh, Z bar will induce okay, K bar, the new Gaussian curvature. The new Gaussian culture, all the Gaussian culture, and the conform factor, they satisfy this special equation. Uh, then on the boundary, the geodesic culture, okay, actually satisfy this equation. So then uh, the problem is that given a shape, okay, that means given a surface, given initial remaining metric, then uh, given the desired Gaussian culture. So what Gaussian culture we want? We want to find this lambda. So namely, we want to design a remaining metric. Okay, using uh, using the desired Gaussian culture. From culture, we want to find the metric. Then uh, it's, it's boiled down to solve this equation. But this equation is highly nonlinear. Uh, using conventional uh, finite, element, finite element method, we cannot solve this. Okay. Uh, then the good way to solve this is, uh, so for example, for uniformization, basically given initial remaining metric, we want to find a new metric such that the target Gaussian culture is positive one everywhere. So in this case, we want to find a new remaining metric. The target Gaussian culture is zero everywhere. Uh, this one, we want to find a new uh, metric such that the target culture is minus one. So if we can solve okay, the Yamada equation, then we can calculate um, this uniformization. Okay? Then uh, this one beyond the conventional computational mathematics. So then we need to uh, find a new way to compute that. Okay, so the new one is Hamilton's Ricci flow. So basically, that's the equation for Ricci flow. Basically, we deform the remaining metric tensor. 
okay, proportional to the current okay, Ricci curvature. For surface case, okay, the cu current Gaussian curvature multiplied the metric tensor. Okay? Then under this equation, so basically the Gaussian curvature evolved according to this um, uh, special equation, okay, diffusion reaction equation. Then this term makes the whole thing okay, uh, highly uh, challenging to compute. Then uh, um, <clears throat> depends on, on the topology, depends on the uh, metric, also depends on, on the dimension. Sometimes this term, okay, will dominate this term, then the, we can develop singularity within finite time. So basically, the culture may blow up at some point. But very, very fortunate, okay? So if the genus is equal to one or bigger than one, then this flow is stable, okay? But for the three case, cases- So you, can I just catch up? So uh -huh. you're given the original surface and you're trying to find lambda? Uh, right, right. We, so that it leads to the flat curvature or right, the right. fixed curvature. So we, we want to flatten the surface. So that yes. means we want to find a lambda such that the, the target causing culture is zero so you, everywhere, okay. except several single singularities. So yeah. in this yeah. framework, you don't yeah. never have to invert G into a surface. Uh, you never have to go back from G to the surface. So basically, uh, if we are given surface in R3, then the surface has a Euclidean induced uh, right. Riemannian matrix right. G already. Right. Yeah. Okay. But, but, but in, in compute, com computation, we do not need the inviting. What we need is only this uh, intrinsic G. So namely, if you give me abstract triangle mesh. But that's always a forward calculation. You never go back from G to the surface. Uh, but for depends on G. Sometimes uh, we, we can, from G, go to the inviting. So from, okay. from, from G to X, Y, Z. Sometimes we can, sometimes okay. we cannot. Okay. Yeah, because uh, if we reset, the, the, the target culture is minus one everywhere, so yeah. that surface cannot be embedded in R3. Right. So we have to embed it to a higher dimension. Yeah, but there's there another another set of theory there. We, we, we can, there's some research along that line as well. Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's also not, it's like, it's not always unique, right? Uh, you know, the, the risk flow is unique. No, if, if you have the metric. I mean, the, the embedding is not unique. Right, that's true, yeah. Like flat embedding, you you have you can have a cylinder, you can have a, a different shape. Yeah, that's true. Depends on the boundary condition as well. Yeah, embedding is a is a different story. Yeah. Okay. Then no, no. basically, uh, Hamilton proved that using Ricci flow. So if genius is a uh, greater than zero, then this will lead to a constant constant culture metric. Okay. So that's everything is based on smooth manifold. So our goal is try to build a discrete theory. Okay. Then uh, from discrete theory to build a computational method, then develop software to compute that. And we spent many years to do that. So uh, in computer, basically, uh, we use a triangle mesh to represent the surface. Okay, given a small surface, we, we sample the surface. And then using a Euclidean triangle to represent okay, each local face, then we glue the triangle together. Um, we call this a discrete surface. Uh, but in theory, so each small triangle could be a hyperbolic triangle. Could be uh, could be spherical triangle, okay. So without changing too much, okay. And how can we define Riemannian metric uh, on discrete setting? So basically, we use edge length, okay. Given one edge, okay, then the edge has a length. So basically, for for triangle, if we know three edge lengths, then we can determine the whole geometry for the triangle. So therefore, we use edge length, which satisfying triangle inequality, to define as a discrete metric. So if we fix okay, the triangulation, the combinatorial structure, there are infinite many uh, discrete metrics. Okay? Then uh, how can we define okay, um, Gaussian culture? So the Gaussian culture is the angle deficit. So given one vertex, okay, then the Gaussian culture is 2 pi minus the surrounding uh, corner angles. Okay? For this <coughs> triangle, we, we, we have three corner angles. And then for, for this vertex, 2 pi minus all the surrounding angle. So this is a Gaussian culture for an interior uh, point. So if we have vertex on the boundary, then the discrete geodesic culture is a pi minus strong angles. So then, then we can easily prove that uh, the total Gaussian culture still satisfy Gauss finite. Okay, they, they equal to two pi multiplied the Euler number uh, of the surface. Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> then we know that. Question: When you're when you're measuring lengths, are you are you just measuring the Euclidean? distance 
in a straight line, or you're trying to approximate the geodesic distance? Uh, okay. So for each triangle, oh, uh, here we, we show this one. So for each triangle, we have three uh, scenario. The triangle could be Euclidean, okay? Could be hyperbolic, could be spherical. Okay, it depends on the, on the problem. Yeah. Yeah, but, but mm -hmm. no, but for the data, you've got a you've got a surface. Right. In right. R three, you've got a triangular mesh. Yeah, yes. So are those distances between the vertices uh -huh. are they just measured by the distances in the embedding in R in yes, R3, yes. or are they geodesic distances? Uh, geodesic. They're yeah. Geodesic. Right? Yeah, basically. Uh, but, but later I will mention some approximation theory yeah, in later part. Yeah, okay. So basically we prove that under special Zambulin condition, triangulation condition, then the, the discrete remaining metric converts to smooth remaining metric. The discrete Gaussian culture measure converts to discrete, uh, convert to smooth Gaussian culture measure. Also mean culture, also geodesic, also Laplace operator. So we, we have some uh, approximation theory. <coughs> later I will mention that. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so in smooth case, we know that remaining metric determines curvature. In this case, uh, it's very simple. It's just cosine loss. So if we know the three edge lengths, okay, then we can determine three corner angles. So uh, for hyperbolic case, uh, spherical case, Euclidean case, we have uh, three types of uh, cosine law. So therefore, from this point of view, this discrete case is easier than smooth case. Okay? Then how can we define um, <coughs> curvature flow? Okay. So first, we define uh, the Delaunay triangulation. So basically, uh, given the arbitrary triangulation, the width edge length, then we can calculate the corner angle. So then uh, for each edge, okay, uh, if the solution of the two corner angle is less equal than pi, then we say the triangulation is Delaunay. Okay. So for example, um, so this one is not Delaunay, but if we do edge slice, okay. Swap this way, then this is a Delaunay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so Delaunay triangulation is very essential. Okay, for all the cases. Okay, then for each vertex, we can define, okay, um, the conformal factor, discrete conformal factor. Then uh, uh, we define one operator called vertex scaling. So basically, we multiply the original edge length by e to the power of conformal factor multiplied edge length. Okay. So this is an analogy to a smooth conformal geometric deformation. So in smooth case, basically we change our metric tensor to, okay, to this way, this conformal deformation. But in this case, basically, we change the edge length, okay, very similar. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Okay, then we can define a uh, discrete uh, curvature flow. So the discrete curvature <coughs> flow has exactly the same form as a smooth curvature flow, exactly the same. Okay, <coughs> basically we deformed the conformal factor okay um, proportional to the difference between target curvature and the current curvature. Okay, so then uh, by by doing this deformation, we change edge length. Once we change edge length, we change the corner angle. Once we change the corner angle, we change the Gaussian curvature. Once we change Gaussian culture, then we can, we can look back, okay? But on the other hand, so if we change edge length, then the triangulation may not be Delaunay anymore, then we, we, uh, we do edge slide to make it to be Delaunay, okay? Uh, so then uh, we, can, we can define something called um, <coughs> conformal equivalence. So suppose we have a topological surface S, then uh, we have punctures, okay, V on, on S, okay? Suppose we have a okay, topological surface. We have many, many points. Okay. Then uh, without any, okay, without any triangulation. Okay. Then uh, we define a uh, flat metric D such that okay, the, the cone singularity uh, on this uh, on these vertices. So everywhere else here, the Gaussian culture is to zero, but here the Gaussian culture may not be zero. Okay. Then uh, for two such kind of uh, D and T prime, we say they are conformal, okay, in the discrete case. So if there is a sequence, okay, a discrete metric, D sub one, D sub two, to DK equal to D prime. Then uh, um, correspondingly, we have sequence triangulation, T1, T2, to DK, such that, okay, first, so TI is Delaunay, okay, in DI, okay. 
then uh, uh, if ti is not equal to ti plus one, so basically that means we do i swipe, okay, to make ti plus one to be double a, okay. Then uh, if we, we keep the triangulation, then okay, basically for for b and b prime, they satisfy this conformal definition. So namely, if we can deform one metric, okay, uh, using this formula, then we change the edge length, we, we, we update the triangulation, and eventually we can reach b prime. We say those two metrics are conformally equivalent. Okay. So in smooth case, basically, uh, if two metrics are conformally equivalent, then they differ by scalar function. Okay. So this is a mimic okay, uh, to this smooth definition. Okay, so basically, so here we show one example given initial map, mesh, okay, given initial remaining metric, okay. Then uh, we, we use a conformal factor k at this vertex to change edge length. Then the triangulation is not the line anymore, then we swipe, okay. After we swipe, okay, we, we multiply the conformal factor at this vertex, then we keep doing this, okay. Then we have fundamental theorem. Um, so this was published in the journal of different geometry. Uh, it's, a, it's a purely a mathematics paper. So basically, this is a existence and a uniqueness of proof showing that. So suppose you give me a discrete surface, okay? Then you give me the target curvature k bar such that k bar satisfies Gaussian Bonnet, okay? Okay. Then we can claim there exists, okay, a new Riemann metric d bar. D bar is a discrete conformal to d, okay? The second, okay, um, <clears throat> so this D bar induce, okay, the desired target Gaussian curvature. And the D bar can be found from Ricci flow, okay, and the D bar, okay, in hyperbolic case, okay, is a, it's unique. For Euclidean case, it's a unique up to scaling, okay. So if we set K bar to constant, then we get a discrete uniform position theorem. So therefore, this is a discrete version for a, a surface uniformization. So what does this mean? So this means that given an arbitrary discrete surface, so if you give me the desired Gaussian culture, we can find a remaining metric to realize such kind of Gaussian culture. Okay? So then uh, another thing is uh, we get a discrete conformal map. And can we say this discrete conformal map converge to the smooth conformal map? If we keep triangulation refiner, refiner, then the wider the discrete uh, result converge to smooth result. So we prove this as well and, and publish uh, in another math journal. Okay. <clears throat> so if you're interested, you can, you can find um, find them in archive. Okay. So then, uh, for uh, for the computational method, so basically, given a closed triangle mesh, given the target um, the target curvature, okay, step length threshold. So we try to find a PL metric conformal to the original one. And realizing the target culture. Okay, so basically uh, we initialize conform factor to be zero. Okay, then we calculate current cost curvature. Then we update. Okay, the Delaunay triangulation by either swipe. Okay, then we use a Gaussian, uh, we use a Newton's method to optimize, optimize some energy. Okay, then we re repeat this until, okay, uh, the target culture and the current culture are close enough. Okay. So here we, we show some computational result. Okay, suppose we try to find uniformization uh, metric for, for this kitten model. So we know that kitten is a genus one, so therefore the uniformization metric should be uh, zero Gaussian culture everywhere. Then we set the target culture to be zero everywhere. Then we, we run Ricci flow, we can find the edge length. Okay, from that edge length, we can flatten triangle by triangle, then we can flatten the whole surface to one period. Okay, then we can copy this period, we form this uh, planar uh, embedding. Okay, <clears throat> for, for hygienist case, same thing. So basically, uh, we treat each triangle as a hyperbolic triangle. Then uh, we, we set the target culture to be zero everywhere. Then we run risk flow, we can find a hyperbolic metric. Then we flatten, okay, the whole surface, triangle by triangle. Okay, we can get one period. Okay, then we can copy this period, form this pattern. Okay, so this is a genus three surface. We calculate uh, the hyperbolic metric. So therefore, the discrete uniformization theorem uh, guarantee the existence, okay, uniqueness for the solution. Mm. Then we can design arbitrary remaining metric 
according to our desired target culture. Okay. So basically, then uh, <coughs> how can we define the, the distance between two shapes? So there are many different ways to do that. One is called the tetramodal space. Uh, so basically, um, <coughs> so suppose given two surfaces, if there exists a conformal map, then we say these two shapes are conformal equivalents. <coughs> so then, uh, um, so if we fix the topology okay, of the surface, then we consider all the conformal equivalence classes okay, sharing the same topology. Okay? Then all this uh, conformal equivalence class form a um, manifold, remaining manifold, which is called a tetramodal space. So each point here representing a class of shapes. Okay? Then the given two points in this space, we can calculate the geodesic using something called a tetramodal map. Okay? So this gives us a way to measure the distance in terms of conformal geometry of one shape. Okay? <clears throat> so for example, um, so here we want to follow this mapping. Basically, uh, we set the target culture to be zero everywhere. Okay? For the boundary, the culture is zero as well. But here we have four corner points. So the discrete target culture for those four points is equal to pi over two. So then if we know the target curvature, then we just run Ricci flow, then we fly in the whole surface, we get a rectangle, okay? Then, uh, uh, so this is called topological quadrilateral. Then uh, the tetramodal space for this topological surface actually is one dimension. So all the rectangles can be represented by height divided by the width, okay? So then, therefore, okay, this is the tetramodal coordinates, give you a global feature for the shape, okay? Then for a more complicated shape, like this one, given this kind of shape with a lot of holes. So basically, uh, <clears throat> we set the target culture to be zero everywhere, okay, and the geodesic culture to be constant, okay. Then uh, the integration along all the boundary equal to 2 pi or minus 2 pi. Then we run this flow, we can get this mapping. Then this mapping differ by Mobius transformation. The tetramodal map for this shape actually is given by uh, the circle and the radii for the inner, okay, inner circles, the circle radius and, and the, okay, uh, the centers. So therefore, there are three n minus three, okay, parameters to describe this type of space. So basically, then by using this one, we can compare, okay, the similarity between two topologically uh, very complicated shapes, okay. So this is a global, uh, very stable, robust to local noise, okay. Okay, um, <clears throat> so this, this is a genius zero surface with three boundaries. Then uh, we can set a hyperbolic metric such that uh, three boundaries become two three geodesics. Okay, then uh, we, can, we can do this decomposition for arbitrary shape then uh, <clears throat> to do this kind of pants decomposition. So a pants actually is a genius zero surface with uh, three boundaries. So then uh, we, we put hyperbolic metric to the whole surface. Then uh, for, for each cutting loop, uh, we make it to be to be geodesic. Then uh, the length for those geodesics, okay. So when you when you glue two pair of pants, there's a twisting angle. So therefore, for each cutting curve, the length and the twisting angle together uh, describe the tetramodal coordinates for this shape. So therefore, we can calculate the the, the coordinates for the shape in the shape space. And by by doing this, we can do roughly classification or comparison, okay. So here is just a computational result. <clears throat> uh, for general diffeomorphism, uh, so basically, <coughs> uh, we showed this before, this conformal, this quasi-conformal. Um, <clears throat> we use something called the Beltrami equation to, to represent that. So we know that we map each uh, infinitesimal ellipse to a circle. Then the, in order to describe the shape uh, for the ellipse, so we need, um, <clears throat> we need orientation for the major axis. We need the ratio between major axis and the and the minor axis. So we put these two information together, form something called Beltrami coefficients. Okay, then, uh, <coughs> so mu is a Beltrami coefficients. The digital morphism and the mu, they satisfy this equation. This is called a Beltrami equation. So basically, if we can solve this equation, we can find the digital morphism. Then uh, this equation is controlled by, by the shape and orientation of the ellipse. Okay, but, but not controlled by, by the size of the ellipse. Then all the diffeomorphism actually can be described this way. Um, <clears throat> then we have this fundamental theorem. So basically, uh, given two G0 surfaces, okay, with a single boundary. So the diffeomorphism between them uh, actually 
uh, equivalent to all the Beltrami coefficients, okay, quotient Mobius transmission group. <coughs> so therefore, this uh, is a good representation for all the diffeomorphism between the surfaces, okay? And then if we know Beltrami coefficients, we can solve the mapping uh, using some something called auxiliary okay, method. So, so given Beltrami coefficients, then we can convert okay, uh, okay, the quasi-conformal mapping to conformal mapping. Then we can use the law to solve that. Okay? So basically, here we show some example. Mm. If we set uh, mu equal to 0, then the mapping is conformal. Okay? So if we, we set uh, mu differently, we get a different diffeomorphism. Okay? Then uh, mm. by changing mu, we can, we can change diffeomorphism very well. So therefore, we can do variation okay, in the mu space. Okay, to control the mappings. So there's a, another method. Can, can, can I ask a question here? Uh, sure, sure. Um, it, as you said, mu has two degrees of freedom, one associated with the eccentricity and the other associated with the angle. Right, right. right. What if you restrict it even further to Tychmuller uh, uh -huh. uh, maps where the k is fixed and okay. you only control size and orientation? Okay. Can you do okay. everything with that as well? Um, that, that depends on, on the input of shapes. So suppose we have two shapes, okay? Then basically the Tachmuller map is unique. Yeah, so basically we cannot uh, uh, specify, uh, specify K arbitrarily. Yeah, so basically, so that, that's, that's is determined by the shape itself. So if I give you two shapes, then right. K is completely determined. Right, exactly, exactly. And that K is the Tachmuller distance. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, then uh, I didn't mention how to compute that. So in the later part, I will mention how to compute that. Yeah, it, it's more, yeah, something more involved. Yeah. So over here, you're solving the forward problem. You're not mapping one onto the other. You're given mu, evolve it to find how phi. Okay, so in practice, basically, um, we can update this mu, basically. You can find initial mapping, which is, uh, you find the initial mu. Then you can, you can uh, optimize this mu according to your purpose, little by little. Yeah, that is another way. So could you convert this eventually then to a dynamical flow? Uh, I believe it should be something related, deeply related. Yeah. But then in order to compute the Tachmuller map, basically this mu can be can be go one direction. Yeah, you can eventually find that. Yeah. Have, has anybody written down dynamical equations for the evolution yeah. of mu? Or you well, mu uh, yeah, I'm not, not aware of that. Yeah. But uh, uh, but there's some, okay, there's some method. Okay, um, basically, once you find the mu, then uh, you, can, you can update this mu, okay, but not using flow, but using some, some vari variational approach. Yeah, but, but equivalently to, to some dynamics, I believe. Yeah, okay, so that, that's, that's the Hamilton's work. Okay, uh, so later I will mention that. But that's associated with conformal, not quasi-conformal. Quasi-conformal. Quasi-conformal, oh, quasi -conformal. <laughs> yeah. Okay, quasi conformal. So everything here is computable. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so for applications, uh, so so I just put some uh, application here. I uh, may not be directly related to biology, but, but just for discussion purpose, because uh, um, so basically for graphics, basically one fundamental problem is how do we flatten the surface for the two D plane? Then we can put a uh, texture image on a 2D plane and pull back to get a three, uh, okay, visual effects. Okay, like we, we made the marble sculpture, okay? So here, basically, we try to compute the flow uh, on the surface. Basically, how can we design vector field on a complicated topology and geometry uh, satisfied that we de determine the position for the singularities, we determine the index for the singularity. And then how can you find a global smooth vector field Okay, satisfy this topological constraint. Okay, then uh, how can we convert a shape to some sort of very model? Okay, if we have shape, we want to do 3D fabrication. Then how can we find the two finally fibers to weave them together to get this pattern? Okay, <clears throat> so here we how can we transfer okay texture from one shape to, to the other shape? Basically, how can we find a good diffeomorphism between two shapes? Okay. And how can we define one shape to the other one? So this is uh, useful for uh, CD purpose. Okay. okay. Then uh, so here we want to see some problems for conform map. So suppose we have this uh, gargoyle model. So we try to flatten two shapes to the two D plane. So the, the left one using conformal. Okay. Then you see that 
um, <coughs> conformal basically can you induce large area distortion. So here we see the whole wing, okay, shrink to a tiny spot on the 2D plane, okay. But then this will cause a lot of uh, numerical trouble. So when we do rotation or downstream uh, geometric precising, then we compose this one with something called the optimal mass transportation map. So we will get an area preserving map. So um, basically, this mapping preserves area element. So if we draw any uh, any uh, domain on the surface, okay, then this this domain will map to planet domain. Then the, the area of the planet domain equal to the to the domain area on the surface. So basically, this one basically keep um, keep the area element for the mapping. Okay. So this is area preserving. This is angle preserving. Okay. But we cannot achieve both of them. So if we achieve both angle preserving and area preserving, so that mean, means the mapping is uh, isom isometric. So therefore, the curvature should be uh, not equal to zero. We cannot flatten that. Okay. So this gives you the two extreme. So before you mentioned there was a vector field on the surface with uh, specified singularities. Yes. Uh, yes. What's that vector field? Or uh, what's, how is it? what's this vector field? Yeah. You mean the, the purpose for this vector field or how to, con how to construct it? Yeah, I mean, how, how to construct, to construct it. Oh, okay, okay. So th this one actually has a lot of application uh, in the in, in CGD, CAE field. So basically, uh, <coughs> suppose here we have a genius two surface. We try to make a special vector field with a, si a single uh, singularity. Then the, the indices is equal to Euler number. And basically, that's our purpose. So basically, uh, we design a flat metric such that all the culture concentrate on this single point. So everywhere else is totally flat. Okay? So if the metric is flat, that means you can define parallel transportation globally. So therefore, we, we just define parallel transportation on a flat metric. Okay? Then we define one point, okay, uh, the vector. Then we just parallel transport it. Okay? We can cover the whole surface. But there might be some holonomy or those kind of conditions, but you can compensate that. So basically, we have handles. So if you have a flat metric, when it goes back, there will be special rotation. Then you define some harmonic form to adjust okay, the rotation angle. So by doing that, you can get a single singularity. And the unit is equal to the number. Everywhere else is a smooth. Okay. And you prescribe the yes. number of singularities. Right, right. You, you, you give me the position for the singularity. You give me the index. Yeah, then I can find a metric, concentrate the culture to singularities, then you can. And is there uh, um, a way in which one can understand how many minimal singularities you might need if you're given a particular surface? With a so this one, only one. Only one. What is the geometric minimum? Yeah. yeah. As long as they satisfy uh, Gauss Bonnet, then you can do that. Because we have existence here and there. Yeah. Independent of the genus? Uh, I mean, uh, the total index should satisfy Okay. Oh, just through Gauss Bonnet. Yes, okay. Right, right, right. Gauss Bonnet. Yeah. So as long as the indices yeah. satisfy this, you can. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So therefore, so my point is that if you can control the remaining metric, you can do a lot of things. They are really fundamental. So most geometric processing can be eventually converted to a remaining metric. So then, if you know risk flow, you you have this too. So you can do a lot of analysis. Yeah. So that that's that's my point. Yeah. And on the right side, you had five? Uh, this one? Yeah. yeah. The, the user gave us this one. So they want to hide okay, the singularities. So the some part invisible. So we do this. Yeah. OK. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so same thing here. We have this complicated shape. So then we can flatten the shape. Uh, this angle preserving, okay, this is area preserving. Then this one using risk flow, this one using uh, optimal mass transport. Okay, so we can generalize this to volume case, okay, to map the whole volume to volumetric sphere, yeah, okay. So for conservation, so basically we try to compare two shapes. So basically, we conformally map 3D shape to the 2D plane uh, first, then we do rotation using quasi conform map uh, on the 2D plane, then when we, when we pull back, we can get a 3D shape. So we use this one uh, to do a lot of rotation tracking. So basically, given a sequence, a 3D uh, mesh, then we try to uh, extract the human expression. So the blue net actually is the calculated result. Okay, we paste okay the blue net to the first phase, then the flow with the with the 
dynamics or the uh, 3D surface. Okay, so this is for uh, animation purpose, <coughs> for refraction purpose. Okay. So here we show um, <coughs> a refraction. We have armadillo, so they have different holes. So so they, they differ by isometric deformation. So if we use a conformal map, then we see that uh, okay the finger shrink too much, the height shrink too much. Then we use area preserving. We see the finger structure, okay, the ear structure, okay, become very prominent. Okay, then we can find the mapping between this one to this one. So then they can match the fingertips automatically. So we know that uh, we, we can mismatch the fingers, okay, so which give us local optimal in terms of rotation. But then uh, using this method, we can we can easily achieve global uh, global optimal for rotation purpose. So then this one, we try to uh, classify uh, 3D shapes. Uh, we got <coughs> 10 people, so with the three expressions, okay, the, the, the sad, okay, the happy, and the uh, surprise, okay. So basically, the following is the idea. Uh, we conformally <coughs> uh, map each face to the 2D plane using renal mapping. Okay, then uh, uh, under some normalization condition, the mapping is unique. Then we have an area distortion, the conformal factor. So therefore, on the disk, uh, we have a one function called a conformal factor. So each phase is uh, converted to a conformal factor function. Then the conformal factor function actually define a measure. Okay, basically it's the area element on the surface. So therefore, we treat this one as a probability distribution. So we convert each phase to a probability distribution. Then we have a uh, thirty phases. We have thirty probability distributions. Then we can measure. The probability distance, uh, probability distribution distance using something called Wasserstein distance, okay, using optimal transportation. So I will mention this uh, in later part. So Wasserstein distance give us a metric among probability distributions. So by doing this one, we define a, a, a distance between shapes. Okay, so we treat each shape as one point. So for each pair point, we calculate the distance between them. Then we isometrically embed the thirty points. To the 2D plane, so therefore we see on the 2D plane we have 30 points. Then the, the Euclidean distance mimic okay the Wasserstein distance. So this gave us naturally three cluster. So each cluster representing one expression. So by doing this, we can do geometric classification for very general purpose. Okay. <clears throat> did you have to when you did the flattening? Don't right. We use conformal. Show the landmarks. Or to, are there any landmark registration? Uh, okay. So basically. <coughs> Uh, we, we, we map the tip or nose to the center. Okay. So just one landmark. Uh, then also we, we, we the, the okay the, the corner huh corner eyes okay. should be horizontal. So basically those two conditions. Then we can guarantee the remain mapping is unique. Okay. Yeah. Then the, the, the area distortion gave us the problem. That just removes the Mobius transformation. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, <coughs> then. <coughs> Okay, so here we do some uh, rematching. Uh, basically, we try to mimic, we try to compress geometric data, given a, a uh, complicated surface. We try to reduce number vertices. So basically, by using a um, optimal transformation and a conformal mapping, we flatten the surface to the two D plane. Then we can we can change okay the planar area according to curvature. So basically, if we preserve area, we get this mapping. If we, we area plus culture multiply 0.1, we get we get, we get this mapping. So we, we increase the width for culture, we get different mapping. Okay. So basically, then we sample on this image, then pull back to the surface. Okay. <coughs> so basically, um, so th this is our compression result. This is the conventional result. Using 1K vertices, you see we get a better compression result. We preserve okay the IDs very clearly. Okay. Do you need to go back here? It's okay, okay. Like from the disk to the surface? Okay. After oh, yeah, yes, uh, yes, the mapping is one to one. Yeah. The mapping is a bidactyl. Yeah, basically. Okay, then we increase the body for the vertices. Okay, we get different. Okay, so this is the theorem. <coughs> okay, for uh, approximation. Okay, uh, so basically, given a small surface in R3, Okay, then uh, uh, we calculate a conform map, map surface to the 2D plane. Then uh, we, we sample, okay, on the 2D plane, and then make the triangulation to be dot on A. We pull back, okay, the triangulation 
to form a discrete 3D surface. So each triangle is a Euclidean triangle in R3. Then we prove the following theorem. Okay. So basically, uh, the smooth the smooth Gaussian curvature measure and the discrete Gaussian curvature measure, okay, less than k multiplied epsilon. So k k is a constant determ determined by the geometry of the surface. Epsilon is the edge length. Okay. So this is the <coughs> convergence in terms of Gaussian curvature measure. Uh, then also uh, H is the mean culture, mean culture also converge. Then the, uh, the geodesic, okay, also the Laplace operator, everything converge. Okay, so so this gives you the approximation theorem. Then um, okay, so this is for CD purpose converting from cloud. Okay, so those for okay for networking purpose. Okay. Okay, for magnetic imaging, we do a lot of image registration, shape registration. So given a 2D plane with a, with a landmarks, then we can use a quasi-conform map to find a good registration. And given the different energy, we can consider that. Okay. And here, we try to analyze uh, the bone structure and compare the shape. So this is a genus one surface. Then uh, we can flatten the surface to the 2D plane. Okay, and then we, we can find a map on the 2D plane. Okay. So then we get a get one to one correspondence. We can analyze the local shape distortion. So this is another okay uh, organ. So basically, we try to see the deformation of this one. Same thing, but here we're using hyperbolic metric for letting the shape to the two D plane. Okay, do the comparison. For brain, same thing. Uh, we slice the brain along okay the sockeye and the gyri, uh, conformally map to the two D plane, so that the landmarks become two boundaries. Then we can find the mapping between them. So basically, we can analyze the local deformation pattern. Then uh, from this, we can get a lot of information. <clears throat> OK. So here, we show conformal brain mapping. This area preserving brain mapping. So each color representing different functional area. Okay. So from this image, we can, we can do a lot of analysis. So this one is for colon cancer detection. So we use CT to get a colon surface with a lot of holdings. Okay. And by using conformal map, we can flatten unfold, okay, all the internal structure. Then we can find uh, all the polyps, okay, basically. So if we have two columns scanned uh, differently, so because the column is really soft, so the deformation is really large, okay, so using this method, we flatten to the 2D plane, so the mapping here is much easier than direct mapping in R3. Okay. So here, uh, we do some experiment um, from, from the shape, okay, of the brain to tell the IQ. So basically, we collect more than uh, 300 students uh, record uh, and do very carefully IQ test that we scan their brains. Then we can classify their brains and then determine the distance using uh, uh, the method I just mentioned. So here uh, we have a okay, 200 brain. Here we have 200 brain. Before each brain here, we find another brain here okay, and compare. So, so if they, they are very different, okay, the pixel is, uh, is lighter. Otherwise, it's darker. Okay, so the brain here are sorted using the IQ. So there you will see that. So if two brain, okay, are very close in terms of IQ, they close to the diagonal. So then they, it seems a, a bit of darker. So this means that uh, the geometric similarity between two brains uh, is correlated to their IQs. Okay. This was the circle su surface. Or yeah, particle surface. Not yeah. the subcortical structure. Right. Right. Not. Yeah. Okay, but later we tried to test for EQ, but then we failed. <laughs> so, so EQ actually is more complicated. Okay. Okay. So for recruitment purposes. Okay. So, uh, so this is the first topic uh, using conformal geometry. Uh, okay. Let me see. Uh, <clears throat> so the second one is much faster. So the second one is using foliations for comparison. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So basically, foliation means that we can decompose higher, higher dimensional manifold to lower dimensional manifold. So here we decompose surface to many, many loops. But there are some singularities. There are finite number of singularities. Okay? Then uh, if we draw arc, okay, so that the number of leaves across the arc is called a, they will give us a measure. So therefore, this structure is called a measured foliation okay, on general surface. Okay, then, uh, 
uh, the measured foliation actually can roughly give us some information about the shape. So therefore, we are interested okay, to compute this. So here we show different shapes and different foliations. Okay. So basically, uh, given a surface, okay, so with a local atlas, okay, so if the chart transitions are holomorphic, we say the surface is a Riemann surface. So basically, so given surface uh, with a Riemann metric, using isothermal coordinates, then basically we see this kind of chart give us uh, the conformal, conformal structure for the surface. Okay, so therefore, any compact metric surface must be a Riemann surface. Okay, then the foliation actually can be represented as a locally horizontal line or locally vertical lines. Okay, so here we see the singularities. Okay, another singularity. Okay, then the singularity can merge and split. Okay, so this is called a uh, white hat moves. Okay, then we can define the equivalence among foliations. So if there is a diffeomorphism from surface to itself, then map one foliation to another one. We say two foliations are equivalent. Um, <clears throat> okay, then uh, on Riemann surface, there are another thing called a uh, holomorphic differential. So locally, so holomorphic differential can be represented this way. Phi is a holomorphic function, dz is a local parameter. Okay, z is a compact parameter. So here we show a uh, holomorphic one form. Okay, so this one is a holomorphic one form. Then if we locally we multiply them together, Actually, we get something called a holomorphic quadratic differentials. Okay. Okay. So locally, holomorphic quadratic differential has this kind of representation. Then uh, all the holomorphic quadratic differentials on the surface form a group. Our purpose is try to compute the generators for this group. Okay. So they give us all possible uh, foliations for the surface. <coughs> so here we show different foliations. Okay. Okay. We see uh, the trajectory. Okay. For genus three case, <clears throat> so here are singularities. Okay, uh, so basically, if we know uh, holomorphic quadratic differentials, we know all the foliations. Okay, so basically, uh, there's some fundamental theorem saying, given the foliation and the quadratic differential, actually they are equivalent. Okay. Okay, so here we just uh, <clears throat> show the computational process. So basically, first we do Pan's decomposition. So here, mm -hmm. given hygienic surface, then we find the loops to cut the surface to become pants. Okay, then uh, we treat each pants as one node. Okay, each uh, each loop become an, an edge. So therefore, we can get this graph. For example, here we have a genus three surface. Okay, then uh, we have four pants, four pairs of pants. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Okay, then between each pair of pants, there's an arc. So this arc becomes to this one. So this loop becomes to this one. This one becomes to this one. So therefore, uh, we can construct this kind of kind of graph. Okay, then we compute a harmonic map between the surface, okay, and this graph. So each point, okay, on the graph, uh, corresponding to a loop on the original surface, okay. And uh, all the loops or all the foliation can be computed, okay, basically in this way, okay. Then uh, we calculate the basis for uh, all the holomorphic quadratic differentials. Then uh, we can linear combine them. We can generate all possible foliations, okay. So that that's basically the idea. Then uh, we can use foliation to do a lot of shape analysis purpose. For example, so here we have two surface three surface, uh, genus three surface. How can we find one to one mapping between them? So basically, we found a consistent foliation between those two shapes. Then uh, uh, each leaf map to one leaf there. So this gives you a rough okay, correspondence between two shapes. So globally, they look similar, but the ge geometry looks very different. But using foliation, you can, you can find the similarity okay, in a more intuitive way or concrete way. Okay? <coughs> so here we, we show more example. So here we have a genus two surface. So here we have another genus two surface. We try to find the mapping between them. So basically, uh, we, we build the okay consistent foliation. Okay. Then we map leaf to leaf. Okay. Then the singularity to singularity. This gives us the one-to-one -one map between them. Okay. So here now we can see 
consistent texture mapping. So uh, each block might be two blocks here. So you can compare the deformation locally. Okay. So this one also genius two. Mm. So. So basically, we try to find the mapping between this shape and this shape, okay? And using a consistent texture mapping to indicate the correspondence, okay? So uh, suppose we have this hidden model, so that the shape has been deformed. We try to find the mapping between, the, between this uh, as, a, as, a, as a metric surfaces. Basically, so when the surface deforms, okay, the foliation doesn't deform too much, okay? So the same. Same leaf, okay, match to the same leaf. So this gives you a global um, coordinates on the surface. By doing this, we can easily uh, match two shapes, okay? Then we use this one to register two brains, okay? Using uh, the landmarks, okay, as a boundary, calculating the consistent foliation, and then compare, okay, different leaves. So the leaves in this case are one-dimensional curves, right? Uh, right, but on curve you can still do further further comparison. Yeah. So basically, foliation gives you a global coordinate system in some sense. Yeah. Because foliation is more more combinatorial and topological, but also related to the geometry. Yeah. And then uh, it has a it has a many many such kind of foliation. Then using that, you can find correspondence very easily. Yeah. If you deform the shape. The foliation will deform accordingly in some sense. Yeah. Okay, so that, that's our intuition. Yeah. Mm. So here is for some engineering application. Given foliation, we can compute the quad mesh. Okay, and from quad mesh, we can find a hex mesh. Okay, and the hex mesh is uh, okay. Also for uh, fabrication, uh, basically we try to build some complicated shape. Then we decompose shape using foliations. Two family foliation are uh, orthogonal to each other. So one family foliation is a, is a black, another one is a white. Then we weave them together. We can, we can uh, achieve arbitrary shape. Okay, that one shown here. We get a high genius okay, uh, <coughs> surface using foliation. Okay, so this one, we make the big hand using two family foliations. So this is useful for uh, manufacture, okay, uh, 3D printing, those kind of stuff. Okay. <coughs> Okay. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Then we, we come to to the okay third topic. We try to use uh, uh, optimal transportation theory to understand deep learning. And then uh, uh, so this also give give us the computational method for area preserving mapping. And okay. <clears throat> so this is collaborated with Professor Yao, okay, Professor Luo, okay. Uh, so basically, we are thinking about the three problems. So why does a deep learning work? Then uh, how to quantify the learning capability for deep neural network? Then uh, how does deep learning manipulate the probability distributions? So, okay, the first topic. <coughs> so we know that deep learning is, uh, is really successful. Then uh, in deep learning <coughs> field, uh, there's a common belief, so which is called a manifold assumption. So basically, natural high-dimensional data actually they concentrate close to a nonlinear, okay, low-dimensional manifold. So therefore, the meaningful data set, they must have some kind of low-dimensional structure there, okay? Then uh, for, for, okay, there's an, another cluster assumption. So basically, the distance among probability distributions or subclasses on the manifold are far enough to, uh, uh, to verify them or classify them, okay? So basically, those are the common belief okay, in the field. Okay, so this is our setup. So basically, uh, Rn, is the ambient space, like the image space, okay? Then we consider all the human face images. So all the images of human face, they form a low dimensional manifold, okay? Suppose the image is 100 by 100, then this ambient space is really high. It's a 10,000 dimension, but for human face, dimension is much lower. Now from our experience, we believe human face manifold is about 100 dimension, okay? Okay, then no, no. Uh, so basically, given one image, we can we can assign a probability whether this image belongs to a human face or not. So therefore, we have a distribution okay, on the ambient space, but the support of this distribution is close to a low dimensional manifold. Okay. 
Okay, then the deep learning basically map this manifold okay, to the something called feature space or latent space. So basically, each local parameter they call a feature vector. Okay, then the, the latent space basically is a parameter domain. Okay, then the, 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 the local parameter is called a feature. So basically, we can do translation between uh, between <coughs> geometry and the deep learning in this way. Okay. Okay. Then no, no, the mapping is not unique. Uh, for the same open set here, we can have different mapping. So different mapping differ by by a chart transition here. But this one will change the probability distribution. Okay. So we have human facial images. Okay, distributed on this manifold. So this mapping will push forward this distribution on a latent space. By finding this map, we can we can manipulate the distribution on the latent space. So that that is our framework. Okay. Uh, so, for example, uh, suppose the ambient space is R three, okay? Then uh, uh, the manifold is this Buddha surface. It's a two manifold, okay? Then uh, uh, <coughs> we can map this manifold to the two D plane, okay? Using uh, remember mapping. The mapping is not unique. We can either map this way or map this way, okay? But then a different mapping will change the distribution. So if we put uniform distribution on a latent space, when they pull back, we see that on the original manifold, the distribution is not uniform. Okay? But if we use this mapping, we put a uniform distribution here, we get uniform distribution here. Okay? So therefore, by changing the mapping here, we can we can by changing the mapping here, here, we can manipulate the distribution, which can be simplified deep learning task a lot. Okay? Okay, <clears throat> so basically we consider a human facial image. So basically, we can de determine the, the shape of the face by genes, right? So that the parameter is is a uh, <coughs> couple of things, okay? Also the lighting condition, okay? And the, the, the uh, makeup and the environment, okay? So from our experiment, we see that uh, if we're using 100 dimension to model human face image manifold, sometimes it's good enough, okay, for most purposes, okay? Okay, uh, then in deep learning, there's one model called a generic model. So basically, given a white noise uh, in the latent space, we want the neural network to generate one image. Okay, it looks really, really real. Okay, given a white noise, we want to produce something that looks really real, but nobody knows whether such guy exists or not. So this is called a generic model. Okay, okay. <clears throat> then we know that uh, in deep learning, we can rewrite all the, all the classical algorithm in the image processing. For example, for uh, denoising. So if we try to denoise an image, basically we do Fourier analysis, then we do low, low pass filter, but in deep learning we do different, okay? Suppose we learn, okay, this human facial image manifold already, then the P2 <coughs> is a noisy image, okay? Then we project this point, okay, to the manifold. Then we find the closest point on the manifold. Then this one actually is a clean human face image. Basically, this projection meaning denoising. Okay, so so this this is uh, our understanding to the machine learning based okay denoise. But then the pre assumption is that so this image representing a human face, this manifold is a clean human face manifold. So if you use a, a like other manifold like cat face manifold, then this projection doesn't make sense. Okay, so therefore, the question. So how do you know that's a manifold? Not like a fraction. Uh, so, so here we, we just do some argument. <clears throat> so given the human facial image, right? So uh, there are a finite number to determine the, the image. Okay. So this number is much less than the image size. Yeah. You, you, you see that for all the natural data, machine learning is really good. But for very artificial data, machine learning is not good. Yeah, basically. Okay, same thing. So therefore, the, 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 the central task is to learn this manifold. Okay, then if we have this good manifold, we can do a lot of things, yeah. Okay, so here we show um, <coughs> using deep learning to do the noise. So basically, um, <coughs> okay, so those are the noisy image, noisy image. Okay, after projection, we get a cleaner image, cleaner image. So basically, the manifold is a human facial manifold. Oh, what is the metric? Um, <coughs> But so far, we just put it in the, uh, in, the, in the deeper neural network. Okay, there's no rigorous analysis yet. Yeah, we have some loss function. We just minimize loss function. Yeah. But how you measure how uh, the T 
tilde differs from B. Right, so right. Well, it's not exactly Euclidean, so I can say that. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that's just a, okay, just one framework to explain. Yeah. So, so you're using this uh -huh. with your manifold interpretation. Right. It's right. trying to explain the deep learning, or yes, you're yes, actually yes, trying yes, to do yeah. something with geometry and deep learning? Uh, part of, uh, you will see. Okay. <laughs> yeah, later part will become to geometry. Okay. Yeah. A uh, question? So, so do you believe that that's really a uh, manifold, or is it a stratified space, or? Uh, could it be, could it be. Yeah. yeah. But so far, all the deep learning, they, they just learn a small neighborhood for the manifold. Yeah, and they say, they say something because your data is not enough, so basically we cannot learn the global structure, only local structure. And they say it's something called a, something called a generality, extendability, something, using different words to, to describe that. Yeah. Okay, so it's very really premature. Yeah, then we just try to give a framework to explain this. Okay? Then if we use the cat face manifold, okay? Then the other result uh, doesn't make sense. Okay? <coughs> okay, so here we see that. Uh, the same input image, but, uh, but the manifold become to cat image. Mm -hmm. Then we see the result doesn't make sense. Okay, so this means that deep learning method for humidity noise heavily depends on the domain. Okay, if the domain is different, the method is not general. So, so in other words, it's a, it's really a statistics in some sense. Yeah. Okay. Then, uh, how does the deep learning learn manifold? So, uh, so here we show one simple way using something called autoencoder. So basically, the input uh, is a is an image. So the output is an image. Okay. So basically, uh, we have a bottleneck here. Okay. So basically, the input image after processing, okay, map to this low dimensional latent space. So the model bottleneck representing the latent space. So you convert a data set, data point, to a point on the latent space. Then we come back to the original one. The last function basically we compare the input and the output. We would adjust the parameters such that the L2 error is minimized for large data sets. Okay? But then the bottleneck determines the dimension for the data space. Okay? So this, this is a very commonly used in deep learning field called the op encoder. So basically, um, okay, now we see that. So uh, today, all the DN using ReLU function, which is a piecewise linear. So therefore, from layer to layer, you just compose, okay, uh, okay, redo function uh, with a with a linear map, redo function with a linear map, redo function with a linear map. So therefore, eventually, the whole, okay, the whole mapping is a piecewise linear, is piecewise linear, okay. So here we try to uh, visualize the piecewise linear structure. We do this low dimensional experiment. So basically, we do an input manifold like this one. And then we, we density sample this manifold. So each sample point is uh, in R3 on the manifold. Then we use that put to an autoencoder. Okay. Then the, uh, the output gives you also the three dimensional points. Okay. If we learn good enough that the result converge, then we get a reconstructed manifold. So you can compare the original manifold <coughs> and the reconstructed manifold. Looks really good. But in the bottleneck, we set a dimension equal to two. So therefore, you convert three dimension to two dimension. So here you can using a geometry method to do that, but using deep learning you can also do that, basically. But I should mention the efficiency of deep learning is much lower. Yeah, it's much more expensive. Yeah, but but, uh, but uh, deep learning can do arbitrary dimension. Okay. So here because we can visualize everything, we can do analysis. Okay. Then uh, suppose given one point here, then uh, okay some neuron will be activated in the neural network. So if we have two points, they share the same activated neuron, neural network paths, we say they belong to one cell. Okay? So we get this cell structure. So the mapping, okay, the encoding mapping, okay, let me come back. So from R3 to R2 is called encoding. From R2 to R3 is called decoding. Okay? From, <coughs> from data to feature is called encoding. From feature to data is called decoding. Okay? Then both encoding and decoding are piecewise linear maps. Then we draw the piece, okay? We see uh, the piecewise linear mapping uh, subdivide the whole input space to many, many pieces, okay? In lat latent space, we get many, many pieces, okay? So here we get a, another um, decoding, decoding, uh, compose, we get more pieces, okay? Okay, so then we define um, 
something called a complexity for relu here. And basically, that is the max, maximum number for the piece. So basically, we want to use the neural network to learn a highly nonlinear map. So therefore, locally, the mapping is linear. So therefore, the piece, the number of pieces, give you the capability for learning. So therefore, we define this complexity as the capability for the neural network. OK? OK, <clears throat> then we can estimate the upper bound for neural network. So this gives us uh, some, some, something computable, basically. But on the other hand, let's say we see that given a manifold uh, <coughs> in R3, so here, like this one, so we try to find a piecewise linear map to map this one to, uh, to the lower dimension. So we have one dimensional curve. If we do projection, we can map this one one to one to the, to the line here. But for this one, we cannot do projection. So basically, given arbitrary line, you cannot find such a line. The projection gives you one to one map. Question? So that, that uh, cell complex that you were showing? Oh, uh, yes. If I start with a different initialization to the neural network, right. how different would the cell complex look? Or would it be qualitatively quite yeah, similar? Yeah, we, we, we haven't reached that point. Okay. So here we do everything as a max. <laughs> yeah, so the estimation here is really rough. Really rough. Give you the absolute upper bound. Yeah, but there should be a lot of things can be refined. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So here we see that. So this curve cannot be uh, projected to one line without a cutting. Okay. So basically, if we subdivide this curve to two parts, then we can do uh, mapping here. So therefore, uh, we say this curve is a uh, uh, linear rectifiable. This one is not. Okay. So basically, the given given a manifold, we try to find, okay, the number of pieces to cut it such that each each piece can be flattened, okay, using a linear map. So then uh, this gives you another number. So this number is the difficulty to learn this manifold. So therefore, we define two concepts. Uh, one is the capability of the neural network to learn something. One is the difficulty for manifold to be learned, okay. Then if we have a manifold which can learn this manifold, uh, then uh, the difficulty must less than okay, the capability. Okay? So this gives you some theoretic argument for some kind of shape which cannot be learned. Okay? Yeah. So but basically, the, the, this should really be uh -huh. uh, below the minimum number of charts <coughs> right, right, of the yeah. atlas. Right, right. In some sense. And how, how close <coughs> you get to that? Uh, well, here we just uh, define a definition for manifold. Yeah, but uh, uh, we have some some preliminary theory, but uh, haven't. Yeah, <clears throat> but uh, the, the an analysis is is not easy. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So here, uh, so basically, we use a Whitney embedding theorem. Okay, to give some argument. Okay. So then we can we can easily say that given arbitrary relu uh, deep neural network. So if we fix the architecture, then uh, we can find a manifold. Okay, which cannot be learned by this neural network. So basically, this is a piano curve. Then we can we can use a recursion to make it more and more complicated. Then we see uh, one building block for piano curve. So this building block cannot be learned. So we have to subdivide this building block, okay, to, to make it learn learnable. So therefore, we can construct an uh, arbitrary, <laughs> okay, com complex, okay, manifold. So the manifold uh, complexity is this one. So therefore, using this one, we can we can show that for arbitrary neural network, we can easily construct manifold which cannot be learned. Right. Okay. So this is the uh, uh, capability <coughs> and the difficulty to learn. The second part, then, uh, how can we control the probability distribution in the deep learning? Uh, okay, set up. <coughs> so here, for genetic model, basically we try to generate a white noise. Then from in the latent space, from this white noise, we we get a, a meaningful image. Okay. So we know that uh, people using GAN model to do that, basically. We have a discriminator, we have a generator. Then the generator generates some sample. So discriminator gets two samples. One is a real one, one is a fake one. Discriminator can try to analyze. OK? OK, so then uh, um, we use a neural network to represent the generator, to represent the discriminator. Then, so this one is given by Goodfellow. Um, <clears throat> so Z is a uniform distribution or Gaussian distribution. Okay, in the latent space. Then the, by encoder, we get this green distribution. So this is a generated distribution. Okay? 
the dot is a data distribution. So the goal for generator is try to make the green curve okay, coincide okay, with the dots. <coughs> yeah. And the blue curve actually is a discriminator distribution. So we see that. So fundamentally, GAN model try to model okay, the data, okay, uh, data distribution using this green curve. Then this green curve actually, the input to the green curve is a uniform distribution. We will try to find a map, map uniform distribution to the data distribution. So that's the fundamental okay, rule behind the GAN model. Okay. <coughs> okay. <coughs> so therefore, uh, <coughs> so then everything becomes to something called an optimal mass transportation. Okay. So given a Riemannian mani manifold, okay, then uh, all the probability distributions on M form something called a Wasserstein space. Okay. Then uh, given two arbitrary uh, probability distribution, we define a distance called Wasserstein distance. Okay. Then the uh, optimal transportation basically is a mapping uh, from a manifold to itself. Then this manifold change one distribution to the other. Whether we can find such kind of distribution. So this is a major topic. <coughs> So given two bounded domains in Rn with two probability measure, new and new, basically we try to find maybe T, okay, uh, such that T push forward mu, okay, to new, okay. So this is called measure preserving mapping, okay. Then uh, if T uh, is uh, smooth, then we can we can build this uh, Jacobian equation, okay. Then we, we can define our uh, transportation cost. So given point x. So the unit is Tx. The C is the cost to move a unit mass from this point to this point. Okay. Then we multiply the total mass. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so for example, suppose this is a territory. Okay, for some country. Then we have two uh, distributions. One is the potato production rate. One is the potato consumption rate. Then uh, for the government, we try to make a transportation plan to move potato from one point to another point. Okay, such that. Okay. Uh, for any city, the total consumption equal to the total uh, production, okay, to make this uh, balanced, okay. Then such kind of plan is not unique. We try to minimize the total gasoline, so that's the that's the setup, okay. So then this was raised by Mom, okay. Uh, then the people study a lot of things and get a many uh, <coughs> theoretical result, okay. <coughs> so basically, uh, Mom, okay, raised this uh, problem. They try to minimize the transition cost. Okay. Then the Kanta Rowich okay, generalize this okay, to something called a transition scheme, okay, using joint probability to describe that. Okay. Okay, so this is the Kanta Rowich field problem. Then the, all the paper in deep learning field based on Watson theory actually is using this one. Okay. <laughs> Everything is this one. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, um, <clears throat> so this is a double gun model, so we will just skip that. Okay, <clears throat> but then uh, uh, in 1980s, there's uh, another theory, theory uh, raised by Brenier. So Brenier theory actually has a deep relation with the geometry. So that is our goal. So basically, if we're using a Euclidean IO2 distance to uh, represent the cost, okay, then the Brenier claim that the optimal transportation map is given by a gradient function u here. So there must be a convex function u defined on x to r. Then uh, the gradient gave us the optimal solution. Okay. Then uh, from, from this theorem, we can get uh, the equation for this u, which is classical motion pay equation. So basically, mm. uh, we need to find a function u. Okay. Then uh, the highest matrix, the determinant of the highest matrix equal to the ratio, okay, between mu uh, and the mu, and then, okay, this should be mu, not by mu, okay. So therefore, uh, under L2 distance, finding the optimal transportation map is equivalent to solve this equation, okay. And whether deep learning is really solve this equation or not, personally, I believe it does. It definitely, it does. But, but they, they didn't claim that. Okay, we will go there. Okay, but this equation has a very deep relation with the convex geometry, and it can be totally solved using geometry. Okay, so here can we show. Us an what, what is mu over there? So given two probability density, one is mu, one is mu, we try to find the mapping, map one to the other, 
Yeah, like one is a human facial image distribution, one is a Gaussian distribution. Yeah, in GAN model. Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, <clears throat> but then, the, uh, so this is the major point uh, in our argument. So basically, uh, using a linear theory, we can show that, okay, okay, the transmission map is given by this formula. Then we have a ux equal to this one minus phi x. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> and let me write down. Okay. So basically, in that model, there are two neural networks. One is a generator. So generator try to find matching t. Okay. Then matching t is given by lambda u. Okay. But in discriminator, okay, basically they try to find phi. Okay. And basically, this phi, okay, d, d mu plus phi c transpose d mu, this gives us the Wasserstein distance. Okay, Wasserstein distance between mu and mu. Okay, so for the whole whole gap model, basically we have a generator discriminator. So in mathematics, they compute the map, they compute the phi. Okay, but here you see. Okay, u and phi are related to this equation. So this means if you know one, you know the other. So that means we have two neural networks. They are totally redundant. Okay, one of them can be can be skipped. Okay, and so far for all the deep learning okay method, the generator discriminator okay they do not share any information. So if if this guy reach the optimum, then you can write down phi directly. If this guy reach uh, optimum. You can write u directly. So therefore, we claim the current model, um, d and g, okay, actually waste a lot of energy and time. So g can be obtained from d without training. Uh, d can be obtained from g without training. Okay. So the two deep neural networks are redundant. Okay. The competition between d and g is unnecessary. So the, the, the whole story is about we have two neural networks they fight each other. By fighting, they can increase their capability. But then from this theory, we show that this picture is, is not true. Okay, basically, it's part of a biscuit. Yeah. So basically, uh, that, that's our claim. OK. <clears throat> then, uh, uh, because the target culture, or the target probability is given by Dirac probability. Can okay, I have... ask a question there? Sure. Even, even if what you're saying is true, so right, right, saying, right, right. Is, does it mean, though, that if you have an adversarial network, uh, in the context of these GANs, the time required to essentially reach it is improved if I have two networks. What you're right, talking about right, is the uh, Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, they, they can collaborate some, in some sense, uh, collaborate. So is there a dynamical uh, right, right. improvement even though the ultimate mm -hmm. state is not going to be any different? So hard to say so far. So basically, uh, so far, no deep learning really reached the optimum. So somebody did just say somewhere, looks good, right? So nothing rigorous. Yeah. So here the analysis is uh, is according to theory. But then you, if you but this doesn't say, what you are saying doesn't tell us anything about the rate of convergence. Right. 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 But but uh, but one thing is, if we use a geometric method to solve this same problem, we can use a Newton's method. But now all the deep learning using gradient descent. So in theory, we can we can uh, achieve much faster method. Okay. But, but uh, the, the geometric method is too complicated for implement for higher dimension. And what if you use yeah. alternate views of optimal transport? You mentioned Brenier's uh, right, optimization right. approach, but uh, Brenier right. and Benamou also had this dynamical approach, which right, is right. like a fluid flow. Right, right. But that method that, uh, doesn't give you the optimum. So then uh, this condition holds uh, when both of them reach the optimum. Yeah. Exactly, only when you finally reach the right, optimum. Right, right, right. Right, but but that's the goal. But for using a fluid, basically we stop somewhere in the middle. Yeah, in general. Yeah. So 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 it looks fluid is, is much more flexible. But but in terms of theoretic an analysis point of view, they cannot guarantee give you the, the final result. Yeah. So there are a lot of things got involved. Yeah, theoretic and engineering issue. Yeah, basically. But but now we use two neural networks to do this competition, which is uh, is not wise. They should concentrate. Okay, combine them together to compute one. So okay, so basically that is our uh, model. Okay, so then the problem becomes to this. 
So suppose here we have many, many data points, okay? So then we try to find uh, the mapping from Gaussian distribution or uniform distribution to, to this point, okay? So each point has a, has a uh, target area A. So basically, we try to find a partition, okay, for, for this 2D disk, such that, okay, each cell is mapping to a single point, and the area, okay, or the volume for this cell equal to the given area, okay? So then uh, this is a geometric interpretation to the problem, okay? Furthermore, we try to minimize this, uh, this uh, distribution uh, cost. Given point here, x, so tx is this point, so this is IL2 distance. <coughs> we try to minimize that. Okay, <coughs> then uh, according to Brunier, so basically what, what does this mean? So this means that there is a convex function. This is a convex function, okay? And the gradient give you the map. So therefore, uh, the convex function has many, many supporting planes. So each plane corresponding to a cell, okay? Then the gradient of this plane equal to the given point. So WI, okay, corresponding to a supporting plane pair here, okay? Then the, the target, the gradient of that, that image is YI, okay? So then this is the geometric meaning. A question? Oh, okay, sure. I, I should try to finish. Okay, okay, okay. So basically, so this means that we have a bunch of planes, okay? We know the, the normal to each plane, but we do not know the, the height. So how can we adjust the height such that the projected area equal to the given area, okay? So this becomes to a purely uh, <coughs> geometric problem. But then this comes to a Minkowski problem. So suppose we have a convex polytope. We know the normal to each face. We know the volume. Can we determine the shape? So the answer is yes. Okay, then the either send off, basically, given a bunch of points, a bunch of planes, we know the normal to each face. Then we know the area to each face. <coughs> can we determine, okay, the shape? Yeah, the answer is yes. The shape can be determined unique up to uh, vertical translation. But uh, he proved that uh, in the 1950s, but his proof is based on algebraic topology, which cannot be, uh, cannot be converted to a computation method. So therefore, we designed a vari variation method to solve this problem. So we published this one in 2013. Okay, we, we show the existence, the uniqueness, okay, and convergence okay, for this problem. Okay. <clears throat> so basically, we define special potential. Okay, the potential has a uh, meaningful. Okay. So then, therefore, we come back to deep learning. So basically, the deep learning, basically, they might okay, a manifold to a latent space. Okay, in latent space, they can do transformation to change this, uh, this data distribution to Gaussian distribution. Then uh, there are two tasks for deep learning. One is, a, one is a dimension reduction, one is a probability transformation. The second step is totally transparent. We can use in current okay, PDE or optimal transformation to explain perfectly. But now everything is mixed together. But the, the, the dimension reduction this step is obscure. So that means the black box for deep learning, uh, in fact, half of them are transparent. So that's our current point of view. Okay, and then we do some preliminary uh, implementation. So basically, we separate two tasks, okay, dimension reduction and the probability transformation. Then, uh, so, so those are, those are real digits. This learned by different conventional deep learning method. So this one using the optimal transportation method. Okay. So here, uh, so this one we generated using our method. So this is uh, a conventional method. So you see our method looks bad. <coughs> okay. So basically, um, so we introduce a <coughs> geometric understanding for deep learning. So <coughs> we use a medical assumption. <coughs> we define network complexity. Then we use a <coughs> geometric theory for uh, optimal transportation. Okay. Okay. So. <coughs> Okay, so that's it. Okay. Thank you. Maybe a few questions. Lauren, you got to ask something. What? You got to ask something. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> Not now. Uh, well, I, I, let me have one remark. I, 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 I did disagree with what you said about deep learning requiring mm -hmm. that you have some metric continuity because I think what makes them work is that they are able to create because they, they have this, you know, this linear transformation, this affine transformation at every step. They're able to create huge affine distortion in the data to okay. make, make them. And, and so they are somehow incompatible with metric. 
uh, uh, constraints. And okay. that, that may be what happened in the yeah. okay. Sure. Other than that, I mean, why should I have any questions? That's, that's a great thing. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Well, if not, let's uh, thank David one more time. And thank you. Thank you. It's a 25 minutes break. It's 11.